So the first of the seasons that we're going to take a look at in the liturgical year is the Christmas season because this is the season which actually um, where the liturgical year actually commences. So the image you're seeing here is the image of the Christmas season on the circle of the church year. This is a, a resource um, from Godly Play and it's also a resource which emanated from Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Um, so this particular piece of material um, shows uh, the different seasons of the liturgical years and the different colours associated with the different seasons. And you can see from this that Christmas, um, the Christmas season begins with Advent. So you see the four weeks of Advent, which are the purple blocks. Um, the only other thing I want to point out at this stage as well is the direction in which the circle of the church year or the liturgical year is moving. So we start out with the purple and rather than going in a clockwise direction, we go in an anti-clockwise direction. And this is very symbolic of Kairos or the Lord's time as being different from ordinary time, Chromos. In this section, we're going to begin with the content of the Catholic preschool and primary religious education curriculum for Ireland and its content on the Christmas season. And I think that this will be a helpful means um, of orientating us towards a better understanding of the season. So we'll begin then with the first um, level, which is the preschool level. This is the content of the preschool level. So it falls within the strand of liturgy and prayer and the strand unit liturgical year. So you can see the learning concepts then for young children of preschool level. They learn a little bit about Advent and they encounter the Advent wreath and then they learn a little bit about Christmas. So we move on to level one then, which as you're familiar with is junior infants and senior infants. Again, within the strand of liturgy and prayer and the strand unit liturgical year, we can see that the children's knowledge is being built upon. So again, they're encountering Advent, the Advent wreath, recognizing Advent of a time of, of, as a time for getting ready. And then Christmas is associated with the birth of Christ. Um, and the, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. In addition to the Strand um, Liturgy and Prayer, Christmas is also um, encapsulated in the Strand, Strand Word of God and the Strand Unit of Jesus' Birth and Youth. So within that, we can see that the children encounter the story of Jesus' birth in Mark's gospel. They hear about Jesus being the light of the world in John's gospel. They learn about the Annunciation and Jesus' birth in both Luke's and Matthew's gospel and about the three wise men in Matthew's gospel as well. Level two for first and second class. Again, remember we're talking about the spiral cur curriculum, so building upon the, the pupils' previous knowledge as well as adding to that. So the children come within the liturgy and prayer strand and liturgical year strand, the children come to an understanding of Advent as being a four week long period of preparation in anticipation of the celebration of Christmas, which is the birth of Jesus. Um, again, recognizing Advent as a time of preparation, for Jesus' birth. The children also um, are introduced to the person of John the Baptist. And also, again, reiteration of um, Jesus as the light of the world. And they see the prophecy of Isaiah there and Micah. So once again, with level two, um, treatment of Christmas is not just contained within the liturgy and prayer strand, but also we can see within the word of God strand how in the strand unit of Jesus' birth and youth that the children come to learn more about the Christmas story. 
So they hear about the birth of Jesus from Matthew's Gospel. Again, they've encountered that already with the wise men in Matthew's Gospel. But they learn a bit more about the flight into Egypt, about Joseph's dream and their return, the Holy Family's return to Nazareth. They also, in Luke's Gospel, encounter the story of the Annunciation, the Visitation and then Jesus' own birth. So moving on now to level three and again, you're familiar with levels. We're talking about third and fourth class here and within the liturgy and prayer strand under the strand unit of the liturgical year. Again, the children, um, their knowledge about Advent has been a time of preparation is reinforced. Um, and they learn also about the, the, the people of God waiting in hope for the coming of God among them. Um, the Advent calendar is something that's introduced to the children and St. Francis um, but uh, creation of the crib is another one that's um, introduced to the children as well. And they recognise that Advent marks the beginning of the church year or liturgical year. And the Word of God strand at level three within the strand unit of Bible, again from Matthew's Gospel and also from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, they come to learn about the event of the Epiphany. Level four for the senior classes of fifth and sixth class. Again, I'm not going to read down through each of those um, knowledge of concepts from the strand during the liturgical year. I'll just let you do that there for a second yourselves. And again, within the strand of liturgy and prayer in the strand during the liturgical year, So the children are introduced to, at this senior class level to the Jesse tree, which you're probably familiar with, in which on which uh, symbols of the family tree of Jesus are placed on a tree. Um, I think we'll be talking about that later on in this particular video. Moving into the strand of Word of God, again we see further pieces of scripture. Um, in terms of Jesus' birth and youth from Matthew's Gospel, the Epiphany and Luke's Gospel and they encounter the story of Zechariah who was John the Baptist's father. And they also learn how the coming of Jesus was the fulfilment of Hebrew scriptures where the people of God were waiting for a saviour. So in this slide, just captured some of the, the overview of the content that's covered for the children in relation to the Christmas season. So again, just to let you take a look at that. And a few more. If I was to pose the question as to which of the two seasons, Christmas or Easter, would be considered more prevalent in popular culture, I think the answer to this would probably be Christmas. However, from a religious point of view, Easter is the greater feast or season. And again, I'm reminded of the words of the script from Godly Play, where it talks about the time for getting ready to come close to the great mystery of Easter is six weeks. And this is longer than the time to get ready to come close to the mystery of Christmas, four weeks, because Easter is a much greater feast than Christmas. Indeed, for many centuries, there was no feast or season of Christmas at all. And the only elements of the liturgical year in place in the early church were Sunday, 
which we'll be taking a look at later, and Easter, and some local celebrations of early martyrs. So how and when did the Christmas season emerge? Well, it began in Rome in the fourth century. At that time, a pagan festival in honor of the sun was celebrated in the city around the time of the winter solstice as the sun approached its lowest point in the sky. For months before, it could be seen sinking lower and lower and the fear was that the sun and hence light would disappear altogether. The whole of life depended on the sun, crops, vines, etc. So when the sun began its upward ascent, it was a source of great relief and much rejoicing to a festival which was called Natale Solis Invicti, the feast of the unconquerable sun. What the church then did, as it so often has done in the past, and no doubt will continue to do, is to take the stuff of human life and imbue it with new meaning. The church of the fourth century transformed the birthday of the invincible son, Natale Salis Invicti, into the birthday of the Christ, the light of the world. The pagan feast was effectively supplanted by the Roman Christian community and December the 25th was chosen as a date for the celebration of the new religious feast of Christmas. Gradually, the day of celebration developed into a full liturgical season with a preparation period and a celebratory period. Like the Easter cycle, Christmas also consists of a preparatory season, which is called Advent, and a celebratory season, which is called Christmas proper, culminating in the Feast of the Epiphany and the coming of the Three Wise Kings. The four weeks of Advent are neither penitential nor ascetical in the same way that Lent is. Instead, Advent is a time of joyful expectation of the coming of the Son of God anew and afresh into believers' hearts, minds and lives. The spirituality of Advent can be summed up in one word, waiting. Purposeful waiting, not just aimless loafing about the place. Expectant waiting, patient waiting, hopeful waiting. Its spirit is captured in the Advent figures of the prophet Isaiah, John the Baptist, Saint Joseph, and above all, Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Feast of the Epiphany on January the 6th is as significant a feast in the East as Christmas is in the West. Epiphany means manifestation, God's manifestation to the three wise kings who were non-Jews or Gentiles and so who were not one of the chosen people of Israel. And what Epiphany celebrates, among other things, is the universalizing of divine salvation for all peoples in the world, not just for the Jewish people. We'll talk just for a brief moment here now about the manifestations of Christ. So the Feast of the Epiphany originated in the East as a major feast day. And as I said before, the term epiphany means manifestation or theophany, um, understood particularly as a manifestation of Israel's Messiah to the Gentile nations. But it's also been associated with other biblical manifestations of Christ. And hence, historically, at least three events were celebrated on the January the 6th feast day. The Feast of the Nativity, which wasn't celebrated in the East on December the 25th, the visit from the Magi, and the Lord's Baptism in various locations in the first centuries of Christianity, and sometimes also a fourth, Christ's first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. 
January the 6th was called generally the Feast of the Epiphany because there were all these were all epiphanies of Christ. Eastern Rite Catholics, Catholics today, for example, celebrate the Epiphany of the Lord's Baptism on January the 6th and not primarily the Epiphany of the Visit from the Three Wise Men. While Latin Rite Catholics currently celebrate these two feasts on consecutive Sundays. So we move on now to take a look at the theology of Christmas. And this the theology of Christmas can be summed up in four central concepts, which also have a connection with Easter. And these are kenosis, incarnation, exchange and salvation. Kenosis. Jesus' self-emptying. So Easter is about kenosis, but so too is Christmas. It is about Jesus as God departing heaven, divesting himself of the privileges of divinity, as it were, and becoming human with all the limitations which that entails. Christianity is built on the foundation of a double kenosis, the Easter one and the Christmas one. Kenosis has therefore to be the hallmark of the Christian person's spirituality, a spirituality of self-giving, of surrender before God. Incarnation. Having left the realm of heaven, Jesus needed a human nature and a human body through which to live and function in the world. Incarnation means the word of God became flesh thus enabling divinity to dwell in the midst of humanity and on the human stage. Emptying himself of the trappings of divinity made it possible for God to take on human nature and appear in the world as one of us. And that's what the term incarnation means. Equally, the Christian message is to be incarnational. The messenger is the message. Jesus' embodiment reveals the future of Christian truth. The exchange. Some Christian writers use the exclamatory saying, O admirable commercium, or O wonderful exchange, in order to try and capture dramatically the Christmas mystery which depicts God's participation in some kind of barter or other with humanity. God is here understood as making divinity available and accessible to humans in exchange for that humanity which Mary makes available to Jesus, God's Son, second person of the Blessed Trinity. God does a deal, as it were, with the citizens of the world where they supply the human nature Jesus required but in return are rewarded by God with a share in the divine nature. This exchange and union is symbolised during the celebration of the Eucharist when a drop of water is added to the chalice to mix with the wine, suggestive of the water of humanity merging with the wine of divinity. Salvation. Luke chapter 2 verse 11 says, Today a Saviour is born to you. He is Christ the King. These words, sung by angels over the hills of Bethlehem, capture what Christmas celebrates. The whole Christian project is one of salvation. The individual human person cannot save himself or herself. There is but one Saviour and that is Christ. In the letter to the Hebrews, this waiting for salvation theme is well expressed. When Christ appears a second time at the end of the world, it will be to reward with salvation those who are waiting for him. And that's from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 28. The Christmas cycle is about waiting for this salvation with Christ, just as the Easter cycle is about waiting for sanctification by the Holy Spirit. This dual waiting for and partnership with Christ and the Holy Spirit is a fundamental stance of the Christian disciple. 
A function of the liturgical year is the promotion and facilitation of such spiritual waiting. And those four theologies which we've discussed in the preceding slides are just summarised here for your reference. In light of the above, Christmas is essentially a feast of hope, of promise and of joy. Its message is one of good news and the spirit of the Christmas cycle is best summed up in the prayer, Come Lord Jesus, just as the Easter cycle prayer is, Come Holy Spirit. Before we conclude, I just want to return to Advent once again. The general purpose of Advent for Christians is to prepare oneself for the birth of Jesus the Christ. However, for Christians, Ad Advent also anticipates Jesus' second coming, also known as Judgment Day or Parousia. Therefore, the theme of the season revolves around changing oneself to get ready for that future day, since we do not know the hour nor the day of Jesus' second coming. So, for Christians, Advent looks to the past to remember the joy of Bethlehem, when we had the first coming of Christ. It looks at one's present self to see what changes can make one can make to bring about the expectation of Jesus' kingdom. Christians ask themselves questions such as, are we vigilant enough? Are we ready enough? Are we prayerful enough? As the gospel states, we know not the hour or the day of the coming. And finally, Advent looks to the future with anticipation as Christians prepare for their eschat eschatological future, namely salvation from sin and evil. And this threefold emphasis is reflected in the Advent liturgy. So in terms of pedagogy, we've already had a look at the curriculum expectations, which, as you know, are fulfilled in the Grow and Love programme. And indeed, you'll find a file on this loop page which provides an overview of the content of Grow and Love from junior infants to sixth class in relation to Advent and Christmas. And I'd ask you to please look at that file when you've completed viewing this video. In addition, here's a glance at the possibilities around the Christmas season. So the Advent wreath is one that's very, very useful. It allows children and adults too, in a very visual way, to see how the weeks pass, how we are waiting in joyful anticipation. So, as you're familiar with, the Advent wreath has four candles, well, five with the white one, which isn't depicted in this picture. On the first week of Advent, the first purple candle is lit. Second week of Advent, the second purple candle is lit. And on the third week of Advent, the pink candle is lit, which reminds us that we're almost there. And finally, in the fourth week, the purple candle is lit. And on Christmas Day itself, the white candle is lit. The Advent wreath is something which children in the classroom love to be involved in. So you can very simply make an Advent wreath. Um, you can roll up some chicken wire and um, stick in some evergreens into it, very simply done. Or if you have money, you can buy an oasis and you can um, put the evergreen pieces in that way. Loads and loads of different possibilities around the Advent wreath, but something that I would definitely encourage you to have in your own classroom. Jesse tree is another lovely way of building that anticipation, that waiting. So starting out with some of the characters in Jesus's faith line, maybe starting out with Adam and Eve and symbols associated with Adam and Eve and they're placed on the Jesse tree, moving down towards um, Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, right down to the New Testament figures of Joseph and Mary, John the Baptist, and finally Jesus himself. So lots and lots of different symbols of characters from the Hebrew scriptures who are Jesus's faith line 
And again, it's a lovely way of celebrating. So in the junior classes, you'd have fewer symbols. But when you come to sixth class, the children would have encountered a whole range of characters that um, paved the way for Jesus' coming. And this is the third of my favourites. So um, in my own classroom, when I was teaching the, those three, the Advent wreath, the Jesse tree, and this, the empty crib, um, what are, were the kind of the staple um, Advent Christmas materials that I used in my classroom. So the empty crib is literally what it says. It's an empty crib with nothing in it, um, no figures because the time of Christmas hasn't arrived yet. So we're waiting in joyful expectation. And a lovely um, exercise that you know so many people have accessed on the internet is to allow the children each day to place um, a straw, a piece of straw into the empty crib um, so that by the time Christmas arrives, the bed will be ready for, for Christ. And as they're placing the straw into the empty crib, they can either pray for somebody or maybe say sorry for something that they've done. So in this way, they're building up the bed for Jesus, building up the manger. So as you can see from what we've been talking about, Christmas is a liturgical feast which is overflowing with spiritual riches. Its spirit, however, can be swamped by commercial and materialistic considerations. Even within the school setting, the Christmas play, the nativity play can take over and that takes away from the waiting. So for the whole time rehearsing a play where Jesus has already been born and we're rehearsing for the three wise mind, that can take away from the, the joyful anticipation of the waiting period of Advent. So in terms of the commercial and materialistic considerations, a pe any pedagogy of Christmas has to contend with this. So the children are excited from a commercial perspective because Santa is arriving and um, the shops are filled with toys, Christmas trees, decorations, lights, everything. A prayerful Advent is an effective antidote and the best form of preparation for a meaningful Christmas. So a prayerful Advent is an effective antidote I suppose an antidote to the busyness of Christmas, which actually stresses people out. And it's the best form of preparation for a more meaningful Christmas. So finally, just to conclude our treatment of the Christmas season, I want to summarise the duration of the season because it can be confusing. And I myself get confused constantly about this. The Christmas season begins with the celebration of the birth of Jesus. So we've, we've mentioned Advent so the Christmas season encompasses Advent, but the Christmas season proper begins with the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And that's a Christmas day or as a vigil on Christmas Eve. The feast of Christmas lasts for 12 days until Epiphany. However, the time from Epiphany until the baptism of the Lord is also included in the Christmas season. Traditionally, Epiphany had been fixed to January the 6th and the baptism celebrated on the octave of Epiphany, which was January the 13th. So Epiphany on January the 6th and then Jesus' baptism eight days later, which is January the 13th. In most countries, the Epiphany is now celebrated on the Sunday closest to January the 6th and the baptism is celebrated the following Sunday. The Christmas season is a time of rejoicing in the Incarnation and its colour is white. The liturgical colour of Christmas is white. So once again, in short, the Christmas season lasts from De December 25th through the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. So if you want to prove a point or use your Christmas decorations as a teaching resource, leave your decorations up until the day of the Baptism of our Lord. So that concludes our treatment of Christmas and I'll just rem remind you to engage with the um, required reading and one of those is the overview of the content of the Growing Love programme around this theme of Advent and Christmas just so that you can marry what you've learned from the curriculum in this PowerPoint video with the content of um, the Growing Love programme as well. And I'd also encourage you to take a look at the further reading. So thank you.